Between 1987 and 1991, the city of Melbourne in Australia was terrorised by an elusive child sex offender. Police hunted a ruthless paedophile who became more and more confident with every single offence. Crimes that would rapidly graduate in a bid to fulfil his warped desires with deadly consequences. This is a terrifying case of a highly organised, highly intelligent offender who's avoided detection for almost four decades. Make sure your house is secure when you go to bed tonight. This is the unsolved case of Mr. Cruel. My lovelies, welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thank you for joining me. It's actually a really lovely autumn day today. Not that you would know from my backdrop. It could be any season. But I'm just saying, it's a very nice autumnal day before we head for the depressing dark nights that will hit me shortly in winter. I digress before I've even started to explain this channel. If you're new here, I create crime content. It's deep dive. I release it on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. If you like consistency in your life, then this is definitely the channel for you. As always, to those of you who are returning, give me likes, comments, getting involved in live chats. Thank you so much. I appreciate you massively. For those of you who are supporting me on Patreon and my YouTube membership, I couldn't do this otherwise. So thank you so much. And for those of you who are coming to my tour, in the UK, it's been going on this year and it's massive next year. I'm like literally everywhere in the UK next year. Thank you just for supporting me. But it's my mind that you enjoy my content and it is a privilege to be able to give it to you, so to speak. I have covered a case you've asked for today. It's unsolved, let me tell you. I struggle with this. You may have noted from a lot of the content that I create, I like closure. I like my closure. I also like being able to decimate the individual responsible using sarcasm. So when you send me cases that are unsolved and you keep asking for them and I do them, I obviously don't have the individual perpetrator to be able to decimate on a character level. Nonetheless, you asked, I'm doing it but just feel my pain before I start. On the 22nd of August, 1987, in Lower Plenty, Melbourne, Australia, it's 4 a.m. in the morning. It's also during the school summer break. A man, he uses a brick to break a lounge window. He removes the glass and just enters the family home. He's wearing a balaclava, brown tweed jacket, yellow rubber gloves. His balaclava itself is actually open, but he has some kind of material covering his eyes. Just imagine what a terrifying sight that would be straight out of a horror film, but just in absolute 360 reality playing out in front of the victims that would be. He'd come really prepared. He had four sets of handcuffs, he had red and white nylon cord. He had electric tape. He also had surgical tape. He walked in there armed with a kitchen knife and a handgun. And he didn't do it quietly. This wasn't an individual who lacked confidence about what he was gonna carry out. This was an individual who was absolutely secure as far as he was concerned when it came down to getting away with this crime. He enters the parents' bedroom in this house and it's a noisy entrance. He wants them to wake up. 
because he knows at the moment that any parents come round and realize there's an intruder in their home, psychologically, the power over them is huge, it's enormous. And he's taken them by surprise. This is not a scenario where an individual would likely feel they could defend the family in that moment because they don't know what's playing out. They're concerned about the health of their kids. And that intruder knows it and plays that card well. He threatens to hurt their kids. He says, if you make a noise, bad things are gonna happen. Then once he's disarmed them psychologically using this method, he handcuffs the hands, then the feet, and he covers the eyes with the surgical tape and he gags them. So he silences them in that moment and he steals their sight. Then when they are secured, and you can imagine being a parent in that moment, He's threatened your children's safety. He's subdued you to a position where you literally can't escape. And you're hoping beyond hope that maybe this is a home invasion. Maybe this guy just wants to come in and steal from us and he doesn't want us to get into a scuffle with him. And once it's over, everything's gonna be okay. You're gonna be praying over and over again in your mind that that's the case. He then goes into the kids' room First of all, he blindfolds and gags the six-year-old son. Imagine how horrifying and terrifying it is for that child. And once he's done that, he ties him to his bed. Then he ties the hands of the 12-year-old daughter. Now, at this point, the family is secure, essentially. So he has an opportunity at his leisure to do what he wishes to do. And just think about the organisation that we're talking about right now. There is a confidence to this crime, of course there is, but there is also intricate planning without a doubt. After he's done this, he returns to the parents. He says, I just want money, I just want food, clothes, and he actually removes the handcuffs and then he restrains them instead with nylon cord. At this point, he moves them to the wardrobe and he locks them in there. This is when the parents say that clearly in a horrified, terrified state, praying undoubtedly that what he said is true, he's just coming to steal from them. They suddenly tune in to some phone calls that he's making on the family phone and it's sinister. The tone he uses is sinister and it's as if he's threatening someone's child so basically they are listening intently to what's going on. And we appreciate that if somebody is in your home using your phone, there is going to be a belief system within your mindset that there is a sinister undertone to the way that they speak to whoever may be on the end of that phone. But I don't doubt for one minute that in that moment in the wardrobe, they were highly tuned in to what he was saying. Now, ironically, the investigators who went ahead and looked at what had happened as far as the phone call itself and who it had gone to, they recognised it had been fake. There was no phone record, there was no call that had been made. That is so powerful psychologically. And just think about what that says, making that phone call. This is a power play. It's stating that he is in full control. And even though he's terrified this family out of their wits without a doubt, I mean, I cannot even begin to comprehend how it would feel for somebody to come into your home and then to actually tie you up, to place you in a wardrobe, for you to be separated from your children. I mean, that enough is psychologically so destroying that very few people would probably ever be able to sleep safely in a home ever again. Unless, I don't know, they were surrounded by very well-trained Rottweilers and any other dogs that may eat an intruder on command. Maybe that would be something that would make sleeping acceptable from then on. But you know what I'm saying, this is huge. He's already manipulating them this way and he's already terrorizing them, but he doesn't want that just to be the power that he's had over them. No, he wants to additionalize it. So this phone call is totally fake. There's never been a record found and it's all about letting them fear even more deeply the consequences of him being in that place. Think about that. He's got them locked in the wardrobe 
and he's apparently making this fake but nonetheless sinister call threatening somebody's child and they are separate from their children in this moment they're helpless it's a foreboding isn't it that he has some kind of intent and that there isn't a boundary when it comes to children and i think that's incredibly powerful because i also genuinely believe that that's what he wants to do he wants to draw the attention of the parents to the reality that their child isn't safe also at this point it is worth noting that this is something that became a theme in his crimes he would often leave red herrings i suppose we could say by making people think a certain thing or believe a certain thing that didn't actually play out in reality. After he's made this call, after he's now convinced the parents of it, even more of a sinister plot unfolding, he turns his attention to his target. And his target is their 12 year old daughter. So he takes her to the bathroom. He makes her brush and floss her teeth. And then he turns the radio on loud and he rapes her. Now, the assault is clearly harrowing and beyond belief that any human being could ever feel that they had any right to do that to another human being. It's baffling, let alone to a child. But we're seeing a fantasy playing out as well, aren't we? The brushing and flossing her teeth. Yes, it's a control level. Obviously being able to take a victim and make them do what you want that certainly is a power dynamic, but it's more than that. This is planned. So he knows what he wants to do to essentially sexually satisfy himself. And the very fact that he turns the radio on very loud, that could equally be about drowning out the victim's noises and pain and taking him away from the fantasy that he's having in that moment you know what he's wanting to create in his head potentially in that second is a willing participant as opposed to a terrified child so after he assaults this child victim he actually makes a meal at the property again what are we seeing we're seeing somebody who is enjoying the confidence that he has he likes that part of who he is it's about humiliation you know when you go into somebody else's home and you make it your own you take their child you lock them up in their own wardrobe and then you eat the food that they've bought that is a humiliation tactic shows you a level of arrogance and narcissism but also a level of warped joy he's enjoying it feeding on every aspect of a happy family home in that moment now this particular feature of his crime that would play out in future crimes as well it's clear even just looking at this very first crime it was meticulously planned so he's not in any rush think about btk when he killed the Atara family, he took a long time doing it. Likewise, in this case, Mr. Cruel, that's exactly what we're seeing here. He's not in a rush. He felt in complete control of the situation. Bear in mind, he's gone in, carried out this heinous action, cooked himself a meal, and then he actually goes back and he assaults the daughter again. They believe he spent around two hours in the house. So he leaves around 6 a.m. in the morning. Now, before he actually leaves the property, he cuts the phone lines, he clears up the broken glass that he created, and also he stole various items. So he stole a man's red, black, and yellow tartan shirt. He stole an Ecuadorian shirt company, Parker. That was one of a kind. It had a fake black fur collar. He took a gold diamond engagement ring. And he also took a record set of London Philharmonic Orchestra. So after he's done this and he's collected his mementos, I suppose we would call them, he takes the girl that he's been assaulting and he ties her ankles and then says to her, slowly count down from 100 before doing anything. But this is a savvy child. The last thing that she's going to do is just wait any longer. She's been living a nightmare for far too long. Those hours must have felt like centuries. So the moment that she hears him leave, she just runs to her parents' room to untie them. And that's incredibly brave. 
This is a man who's had power over her for a number of hours. She's been through the most horrific assaults and her own parents have been essentially overpowered by him. He's commanding a countdown from 100 slowly. And the minute she hears him go, she's like, screw you. I'm taking control back. And obviously freeing her parents and for them seeing that she's still alive, ultimately probably being unaware at that moment in time what has played out, the relief must have been palpable on all sides. Now the family obviously speak to the police and they give details of the attacker to the police. And they said that he was a guy aged in his 30s, between 173 centimetres and 175 centimetres tall. They felt that he was most likely Australian and they said he had brown hair and was a slim build. They also noted that he had a gruff, deep voice and they said he sounded nervous, but again, Nerves and excitement can often sound the same in a voice. Four months after this attack, we get to the 27th of December, 1988. This is Ringwood, Melbourne. And the Wills family, they'd arrived home, it was around 10 p.m. So Julie Wills and her children, they go to bed soon after that, as you'd expect. John, he actually stays up in the morning until 4.50 a.m. I don't know about you, John, I think, either had serious insomnia or was a bit of a party animal. Either way, he's up till 4.50 a.m. But what John doesn't realise is that at the same time that he's just, I don't know, chilling, listening to music, watching something on TV, he has no idea that somebody's watching his home. And that that very someone had likely been waiting around seven hours for him to go to bed because... What we know about Mr. Cruel in this moment is he is somebody who does not want to get into an altercation with a grown ass man, probably because it wouldn't end well for Mr. Cruel. The very fact that he waits for John to go to bed so that he can make his move is because a man who's actually active and alert is probably going to be able to kick his ass. So he waits quietly. 5.20 a.m. This is when he's figured out clearly that John's not just gone to bed, but he's likely asleep. This man armed with a knife and a handgun just breaks into Will's family home. Now, the way that he got on is he managed to gain entry through the back door and he did this by sliding a newspaper beneath the door and then pushing the key out of the lock and that drops down and you can pull it through. He was wearing a black balaclava had white stitching around the eyes and mouth holes, which is just really horrific to even conceive of. Just the way that the mask would look is scary enough. And that's important because if you psychologically want to contain people, the more terrifying that you appear, the more likely you will get some kind of compliance because it says something about your nature and people read that very, very quickly. Humans read others' body language, behavior, the way that we look at one another incredibly quickly, far more quickly than somebody speaking words. You don't need that. Just a look, a glance, a snarl of the way that we use our lips. These are all things that can give very powerful messages. Likewise, if you're wearing a horrifying mask, that's doing the job for you, isn't it? Now, as before, this guy enters the parents' bedroom and it's Julie who wakes up and she wakes up literally with him pointing a gun at her. Now, she does what a lot of us would do and actually something I actually respect. She starts screaming for her children to get out of the house. That tells me something so powerful about Julie. It really does. It's incredibly difficult to ever put yourself in a position where you can relate to what we're talking about right now. Some of you will have had moments like this in your life, but for the vast majority of us, this is not a reality for us. So thinking about how you would act in that moment is difficult to imagine, but Julie comes around to a guy with a hideous mask on, literally pointing a gun at her, and at no point does she consider her own safety. She just screams for her children to get out of the house. That woman would not 
had given a toss if she had been shot 15 times in her head if she'd known that she'd sacrificed her life protecting her children. And that is really impressive as far as I'm concerned. Now, what the intruder then does is he puts the gun to John's head and he actually says to him, you're not going to be a hero, are you? Like I said, this is a man who doesn't want an altercation with a guy his size. That tells me something very clear about this person. He's armed, clearly he's got the upper hand, but the very fact that he's made great efforts to avoid any kind of physical fight with a man, that says there is a level of weakness within him. He's overpowering them with his weaponry, he's overpowering them with the threat, but actually that psychological defense he's using, and it's an effective one. So in that moment, if John hadn't been overpowered and overwhelmed by the threat, which is just makes perfect sense, this isn't victim blaming John. I'm saying in that moment, if John had bypassed that fear and just grabbed, I don't know, the guy by the throat and then manipulated the gun from him and then ooh, just shot him a few times, likely that that would have played out very badly for the intruder because this intruder knows that a man is certainly his match. But it doesn't work out that way because like you would imagine for the most part, the vast majority of people, for John and Julie, they just care about their children and they're just hoping to God that they're gonna be safe. So after he said, you're not gonna be a hero, are you? He binds them both with copper wire and he gags them. First of all, he demands money, I imagine, at that moment in time, it would just be absolute relief because, hey, pay off anybody. Take what you want. I'll help you carry the TV to your car because no items matter when it comes down to the life of our loved ones. But this is to place them in a really false sense of security. And again, that's power play. They will want to believe this is an intruder who wants to steal from them. They're not going to want to believe that this guy is somebody who's coming to do something horrific to their kids. So arguably, it's making them feel a false sense of security in that moment, which is just difficult to comprehend when you think about what I've explained and expressed in the scenario playing out, that actually being told that they wanted money would feel like a relief, but it would. So of course, after he's done that, that's when he starts to have, I suppose we could say, his warped fun. He enters the bedroom of their four young daughters and he focuses his attention on the 10-year-old Sharon. She was actually sleeping on the top bunk at the time. He went over to her and he speaks her name. He literally speaks her name. Now I have so many theories the moment that I discover that this individual actually knows the name of this child. The fact that he is somebody who disguises himself and so on and so forth, I'm instantly catapulted into lots of stereotypical ideas I have in my head about the particular type of people who may have access to kids and know their names. Just throwing it out there, just my personal opinion at this moment in time. We'll cover it a little bit more in detail later on. Now, Sharon, at this moment in time, she'd already been woken by her mum's screams and she's totally frozen and paralysed by fear because she'd actually heard her mum's scream, then she'd seen this intruder enter her room with a torch and she initially pretends to be asleep. And I can completely understand why. How many of you placed the quilt cover over your head when you were scared of something as a kid. Don't ask me why or where that solution or strategy arrived from. You know, you think that might be a monster or an intruder in your home and you're like, could climb out of the window, could scream for parents, could hide under bed, could descend stairs, throw myself out of the front door and onto the mercy of my neighbors but instead I'm gonna go for the very obvious and without doubt effective method of just hiding under the quilt cover because no one will ever know I'm there. But that's what fear does. Psychologically, we just wanna pretend that we can't see it or feel it or hear it. And where Sharon is concerned, she does that classic childlike reaction of, if I pretend I can't hear it, maybe he'll go away. And initially he does. 
but he comes back in. Of course he does. And he shines the torch in her face and he tells her that she needs to get up. Then he takes several items of her clothing and this included a nighty underwear. He then puts tape over her eyes and he actually puts one of her father's jackets around her and carries her outside. Now, on one level, outside looking in, you can say, hmm, well, that's an indicator of him not wanting her to get cold. I don't think that's the case. I think the main reason why he would put a coat on a child at that particular time is to make it seem less concerning if somebody just glimpsed a child being carried from a home because you wouldn't take a child out if they were wearing pajamas, for example, without some kind of rug or coat around them. Now, at this point, Sharon, she just starts to scream. And I love that about her. I really do. The reason I'm wearing this do not comply t-shirt is because I don't think you should comply. I think you should make as much noise as possible. It's a fighting chance that you'll have. But he's kind of prepared for that. So he places a ball gag in her mouth. He then says to her, I'm going to take it out if you keep quiet. He then abducts her. In all, he'd only been at that property less than 10 minutes. Now, Sharon's parents were desperate, of course they were, and they later managed to break free and they called the police. You can't begin to conceive, none of us can, how that would feel for Sharon's parents. The idea that this man had come in and stolen her, literally in front of them and the ideas that you would have about what was going to happen to her. I don't think we'd ever fail to be under any illusion that this was going to be okay for Sharon. Of course not. As a parent, you're not going to sit there and think, well, this guy's just taken her because I don't know, he wants to adopt a child. You know the malevolence. And to hold that in your heart whilst hoping your child is going to be safe in the end and to just manage to even breathe must be incomprehensibly challenging and without a doubt for Sharon's parents that will be the case. Now Sharon's taken to a house by this guy, she's leashed to a bed and then she is just repeatedly sexually assaulted. That child has been taken from the comfort of her loving home by this monster of a man and now she's been brutalized this way for this long amount of time and to even conceive of what her thoughts are in those moments aside from please let me go please let me see my mummy and daddy again those kind of normal childlike understandings that we'd expect to hear from her what else would she be considering would she be thinking to herself i'm never going to go home i'm never going to get to see my mum and dad again because they're again normal things when nightmares play out in reality for this little girl everything has shifted in that period of time. Now, she does get released and she gets released in the, to the grounds of Bayswater High School. She was actually found by a woman and this girl is just wandering around at midnight. She was wrapped in green bin bags and her father's shirt. One of the bags was actually around her head and it had had an eye and a breathing hole cut out. Now, the use of those plastic bags actually shows a level of forensic awareness. And there is another feature in his crimes because there is an absence of DNA and fingerprint evidence. So this is somebody who is aware. They know what can lead investigators to him. And they want to avoid that at all costs. And they are taking great efforts to ensure that the DNA evidence is not available. Sharon's actual abduction, when you think about what we talked about earlier in the first crime, that is showing a marked change in the offender's MO. First of all, in the first victim, he had assaulted her over a course of a couple of hours in her home. But I would imagine psychologically, it's just not satisfied him enough. It's not sufficient time enough for him to play out his warped, depraved, disgusting fantasies. And it also displays this increase in confidence because he decides I'm going to take time with my second victim. I'm actually going to abduct her and he keeps her for 18 hours. So he believes without a shadow of a doubt that he is not going to get caught in that moment. 
and he wants that time alone with her. He wants to be able to do whatever he's played out in fantasy, in reality. But the other reason that he has taken her to a secondary location without a doubt is to reduce the chances of him being detected. Now, when the police go ahead and speak to Sharon, who, thank God, has been released, I mean, thank God, she has been through the most despicable experience, but she is breathing. And to quantify or imagine to be able to quantify the feeling her parents must have had when she was found, they must have imagined the worst case scenario without a shadow of a doubt. And to know that she was coming home, wow, it's emotional just to imagine it. So Sharon's able to reveal what I think are some pretty crucial details about the man who abducted her. First of all, she told the officers that her attacker had made her shower and brush and floss her teeth. So we see the same pattern as in the first crime. Then he brutally sexually assaults her. Then he makes her wash thoroughly after. So again, he's aware of that forensic detail. He doesn't want to leave anything on her body that could implicate him. Also, before he releases her, he makes a wash and clip her nails. And this is really forensically aware. He also clipped her blindfolded throughout her captivity because he doesn't want her to see him. So the game, making sure that he is completely in control, but also that no one can identify him. Also, to be fair, he did give her enough food and drink. Um, she was even given food whilst he was assaulting her. At one of the points, he even left her alone in the property by herself. And at this point, she lifted the blindfold and she actually saw what appeared to be a camera and tripod at the foot of the bed, which is horrifying because I guess we can decipher from that there is a strong likelihood that he was filming it or he was taking pictures of the abuse. And that, to me, says that he may have been doing it for his own pleasure. But we are all aware that I don't know, there are millions of absolute perverts out there who love this stuff. I do not think there is a sentence long enough for these kind of depraved human beings, genuinely. I appreciate that murder means that somebody takes a life, but when you rape, molest, brutalize children, I don't know, I kind of think you lose all your civilian rights. And I don't think you should necessarily ever get to see the light of day again. As you know, I'm not a judge or the jury. Although I think that if I was the judge and the jury, people would be a lot more satisfied when it came down to child abuse cases. Seriously, what goes on that these human beings get to do this to kids? And even though this is separate, why is it that so many perverted paedophiles are getting released with supervision? A bit of therapy, because they only had two million photographs of children being horribly abused, but apparently that's not a contact crime, so mm, just give them probation. What could possibly go wrong? These videos, these videos will capture what goes wrong. Sorry, I digress a little bit there. I digress a little bit. It is contextual, but I just have some pretty, shall I say, hostile feelings about some of the sentences that these not rights get. And actually, some of the sympathy they get from people who should really care more about the safeguarding of children. And hey, why is it wrong to have a spectrum of care? And when it comes down to child molesters, that's the spectrum of... And children, I give a very big shit because that's what good human beings do. Anyway, I'm going to carry on. Hmm, breathe through it. So when Sharon's giving this evidence, and bear in mind she's incredible for being able to even recount this during a traumatic experience, she gives details about the abductor's vehicle. First of all, she said it sounded like it was an old car. She also noticed the interior carpet and trims were cream. Now, police were able later down the line through interviews to learn that a white Commodore vacationer sedan had been in the area around the time that Sharon was released. They also were told by a witness that the lights had been off and it had actually almost collided with another vehicle. The driver of the vehicle 
actually tried to hide the face from the other driver. So that in itself suggests strongly that we're looking at the person who abducted Sharon in this case. Police were also able to discover that two brothers had been playing and they'd noticed a really suspicious man filming Sharon's family home six weeks before her abduction, which is horrifying. Like, I know we all accept that our home is a false haven. We all know that. The idea that you close your door and suddenly I'm safe from the world. We get it. It's not true. People come and burgle your home. Horrible things happen in your home. Hey, you live with your abuser in your home, right? Our home is not the haven. It's a myth of a haven, but we like to keep it right. We like to have that in our head and in our hearts. The idea that somebody is scoping out your address, filming it, because that plays into the fantasy, but also figuring out your timeline, because that's another thing that the individual's doing who's stalking you. They're figuring out the movements in your home. That's a horrifying thing to imagine. Now, those two lads who spotted this suspicious guy said that he quickly left when they noticed him. They said he was about 30 to 35 years of age. He was balding with brown hair and he also had a pot belly. So they noted these things. I do love how children do this, you know? I could have Elon Musk on a mobility scooter wearing a Santa outfit go past me repeatedly and I would not see him. But you know, kids, very adept at this stuff. Now, Sharon's parents, Julie and John, they were able to also tell the police that they felt that the intruder was about 173 centimetres to 180 centimetres tall. They felt he was in the mid-20s to 30s, and they said that he sounded well-spoken. So, we have two differing voices. The first crime is a gruff voice. This one is well-spoken. Let's all be clear, it's really easy to disguise your voice. You just have to watch my videos and I do lots of different voices. I know most of them involve terrible accents, but you know, it would be more difficult to decipher them if I was using them at different places and I had a disguise on. It would make it less easy to connect me if I was carrying out those crimes. Not that I am carrying out those crimes. And if somebody breaks into your home and is using a very bad Scottish accent, it's not me. Now, unsurprisingly, the authorities immediately suspect that the attack in Lower Plenty and Sharon's abduction are linked because both of the victims were prepubescent girls, so fits the technical definition of a paedophile. Both had been made to do the brushing and washing of the teeth, and one victim actually stated that he'd really carefully washed her before releasing her, said he did this like a mother washing her baby. I genuinely, when I say statements like this, and I imagine that this is a little girl having to describe this horror, I personally want to stoke the flames of hell for him. Honestly, please, Beelzebub, allow me a space to do this. Honestly, I cannot express how angry it makes me that this child had to say this about this monster. So this is a description that he's doing this kind of ritual. So on top of this brushing and washing the teeth, other similarities are that the siblings or parents, they'd all been restrained, gagged, blindfolded at the scene, also they'd then been locked in a wardrobe or a cupboard. And he takes trophies as well. So jewelry, personal items, clothing, and, it was suspected that on both occasions he'd filmed the abuse so he could relive it again and again. Or I don't know, sell it. When I'm researching these things, I don't know why this idea that they're just personally on an ego level reliving it. Like these absolute not right wrong and paedophile child molesters, they share it with people. It's not an isolated individual. There are networks of these individuals. I just 
really struggle with the fact that we still have so many cases where we minimize it to this particular man who is doing it for their own voyeurism and their own enjoyment. It's not. They hang out with other individuals who are exactly the same. And yes, I do understand that paedophiles are not necessarily child molesters. You can be attracted to a child. It's a whole heap of weird and wrong, but as long as you don't act on it ever or look at any content with children or even, I don't know, have a fantasy or thought about a child that you know, then I appreciate there is a level of virtuous paedophilia. That's what they name themselves. But... For the most part, I really struggle with this idea that somebody would just video it and keep it for themselves. I think that it's a useful tool when it comes down to connecting with other individuals who are just like you. So these similarities are very, very clear. Also, another thing that stood out, they use the same style of knots to restrain the victims. I mean, that is a clear indicator that it's the same person. Think about BTK, you look at the crime scenes, absolutely, you can see this person use a particular type of restraint. Another connector within these crimes as well, and this was absolutely a clear connection, is that the intruder used the same style of knots to restrain the victims. Think about BTK. One of the things that is very clear about his crimes is he binds in a certain way. It's very easy to identify that that was a BTK crime, this was a BTK crime. It connects. And likewise, when they looked at the way the restraints had been used in these cases that I'm discussing today, they were the same restraints. And apparently it's a kind of restraint that's often used, kind of knot that's often used by sailors and fishermen. I immediately want to make it clear that that doesn't mean it was a sailor or a fisherman. Because I look back at when I was a brownie and I was also a girl guide, a very, very small amount of time. In the UK, brownies, it was a lot of fun. Just going into the girl guides felt a whole heap of more serious. I didn't last long. But one of the badges that you could do as a brownie and as a girl guide back in the day when I was a child, 153 years ago, was you could do your knot badge. And basically you had to learn different knots. It wasn't something that I did. I'm very dyslexic. Let's just say it would have ended as badly as when I did a dart on a skirt in school because we did domestic science and apparently you don't just do that with your sewing machine. Apparently, just a diagonal line in any material does not make it a dart. But I'm saying that it is possible to learn and know and do these things without having any links to being a sailor or a fisherman. But they're linking the crime this way. Also, another thing that they compared within both of these actual horrific assaults is that they've been meticulously planned. You know, the witnesses said that he was really calm, just throughout the commission of the offence. He knew what he was doing. The story in the media actually referred to him as super cool and super cruel. So this is why from that point onwards, he would be given the moniker Mr. Cruel. And to be fair, not long after that moniker was given to him, he struck again. But before I move on to the next crime, I just want to talk about a bugbear that I have about the press. Look, I know the press want to sell papers. I get that. I know that clickbait is really powerful and important to them, but you do not call somebody like this super cool and super cruel. It just isn't appropriate. I wonder how it happens. I genuinely do. It's like, Jennifer, yes? We need to think about something for this grotesquely horrific human predator who basically preys on children in the most grotesque of ways. He's a paedophilic child molester. He's completely depraved and we need to assassinate his character in the press because when it comes down to losers, this guy genuinely probably has an L tattooed between his eyes and you want something that reflects this kind of heinous human being, I do. I want something that's really demonstrative of the pervert and predator that he is. I've come up with it. Go on, Mr. Cool and Mr. Cruel. I mean, it doesn't seem to depict any of the things I've just said, Jennifer. One could 
almost suggests this would inflate his ego a little bit. Listen, it rhymes. Run with it. Honestly, don't do it. Don't elevate these people's and predators' mindsets further. He will have loved to have been called Mr. Cruel, without a doubt. We get to the 3rd of July, 1990. This is in Canterbury, Melbourne. It's the last week of school term, so they would be breaking up to go on their winter holidays. Now, the Linus family, they were literally due to leave their rented home at 10 Monometh Avenue the next day. This is a really prestigious address. It was also considered a really, really safe area. But unbeknownst to them, of course, what is playing out in Mr. Cruel's mind is that they are the perfect next victims. So he's already targeted this family. He's targeted their property and he knows what he's gonna do. So that evening, parents Brian and Rosemary were actually out. The family were shortly returning to England and they had been attending a farewell dinner. So they'd left the two daughters at home, 13 year old Nicola and 15 year old Fiona, which I think we can all appreciate is a completely acceptable age to leave on their own at home. Certainly, I was babysitting other children at the age of 15 for other parents. So we understand that the parents have made that call, the kids were sitting home eating pizza, and they'd gone to bed around 11 p.m., which I know isn't about judgments, etc. but girls ate pizza, went to bed by 11 p.m. They're good kids, aren't they? They're not like me, staying up till four o'clock in the morning and trying to have a party in between my parents being out and getting home. You know, this says something about this lovely family. He breaks in, he's armed with a knife and a gun. He's wearing a balaclava and it's 11.30 p.m. when this happens. He forces out a window in the parents' room. Again, his chilling calmness was demonstrated when he goes into the room that the sisters are sleeping in. And the point that Nicola comes round, she's literally awoken by him tapping a knife blade on her head. And he tells her, see this here? This is a really sharp knife. This is a real gun. It shoots real bullets below your heads off. Just imagine coming round to that nightmare. He then takes them into the parents' room and First of all, he demands money. Then he tells him to lie on the bed and he hog ties Fiona with wire and then he takes Nicola to the kitchen. At this point, he goes ahead and carries out what we've seen in previous crimes, steals bits and bobs from the home, takes items from Rosemary's purse. This includes her driver's license, it includes her credit card. But Nicola is about to find out that this is not a robbery. That wasn't his primary motive at all. So he then takes the keys to the family car. Just think about this meticulous planning that I'm talking about right now. So he's parked his own vehicle away from the house. And this means that he needs to get there. At this point, he makes Nicola go around and collect various items of clothing. He tells her to get her school uniform. He tells her to get her white tennis skirt and underwear. And then he ties her up. He gags her. He places tape over this terrified girl's eyes and he cuts the phone lines before abducting Nicola. He then tells her he's gonna demand 25,000 ransom. He makes a crouch in the front passenger footwell and he says, if you see my face, it's gonna be very, very dangerous. So he's threatening her. Don't you try to see who I am because if you do, it's not gonna end well for you. Now, after a short drive, he stops. And then, of course, this is at the point that he's going to transfer her to his own car. So, again, sheer confidence, sheer planning. This guy does not think that he's going to get found out at all. And then he drives to another house. Upon arrival, we see this feature of his fantasy and also the desire forensically to ensure his safety, so to speak. So he makes a thoroughly wash and brush her teeth and then he ties her to his bed. But this time he falls asleep next to her. That's another power play, isn't it? First of all, he has no intention of letting her go anytime soon, right? 
he's letting her know, I'm tired now. I've got time. I'll be ready for you when I'm ready for you. And this poor girl who's just been through the most horrific experience has no idea what's going to play out next, but she's stuck with him asleep next to her. The next morning, he makes a dress in a school uniform and tells her that he's got a schoolgirl fantasy. And then he just repeatedly sexually assaults her. Now, bear in mind, like Sharon, he does give her food. He does give her water. The following morning, he continues this fantasy. And of course, she has been there for hours now. The torture she would be going through mentally and psychologically is so distressing to imagine. He makes her get into a tennis skirt, then he makes her thoroughly wash again, and then he sexually assaults her again. He plays out of fantasy games, and he even calls her things like Missy, then he calls her Nikki. And what's really challenging for her is that Missy and Nikki, they're the names that her friends and family use. So he's letting her know, I know you. You don't know me, you don't know who I am, but I know you. I'm gonna use the names that people that matter and have meaning to you use. So that causes a million questions in her head in that moment. That obviously for us shows it has got some prior stalking behavior. Also, Nicola recounted that whilst he held a prisoner, he kept listening to the radio and other victims, they reported the same behavior. And another point, he actually watched a press conference. And this press conference is when Nicola's parents are making this emotional plea for their daughter's safe return. And according to Nicola, he really enjoyed it. He loved the attention that his actions had received, which is another reason why monikers like Mr. Cruel are not good. We don't feed the psyche and ego of these horrific human excuses. We really shouldn't do that. At this point as well, he speaks to Nicola about the fact that there's been the press conference and he actually says, do you think that you're worth $25,000? That in itself demonstrates this grotesqueness. The fact that he's playing with her that way actually suggesting that maybe she wouldn't be worth that much money to her parents. I mean, come on. Her parents would sell their own souls to get that child back. He also weirdly goes and gets into a conversation denying that he had anything to do with Sharon's assault. So he's trying to kind of distance himself from that. But again, a constant theme within these crimes is he just uses particular lies and ruses to try to deflect I think that's really important for him. He feels that he has the power to create these different avenues so that people aren't quite sure if he is the person who's carried out previous crimes. He keeps Nicola for 50 hours. 50 hours. And then he tells her that she needs to thoroughly wash herself. She needs to brush her teeth. And again, at this point, he covers her eyes with tape. Then he wraps her in a sheet and he actually hides her in the car's footwell. Sets off in the early hours of the morning and as before, he parks up, walks her through the streets for several minutes and then finally releases her at an electrical substation in Kew. It's around 2 a.m. And at this point, he's also got her to change her clothes. Again, forensically very aware. Now, after he leaves, this distressed, and I suppose to some degree relieved Nicola actually manages to find a way to a nearby house. It's at this point that she rings her dad. I think that is such a profound moment, isn't it? That the only thing that she wants to do when she's found that freedom is to just call her parents, to let him know that she's okay, but also to hear his voice to have that reassurance, to know she's safe, to know it's real. And then of course the police are soon on the scene after that. Now, although she had been blindfolded throughout this entire ordeal, Nicola was actually really good at being able to give a physical description of who had attacked her. So first of all, she said he was white, he was Caucasian. 
She believed that he was aged between 30 and 50. He was around 170 centimetres tall, fairly well built. Apparently had that small beer belly. So we're seeing that consistently within the descriptions and that he had fair or sandy hair. She said that he spoke with a gruff Australian accent and that he used some really old fashioned phrases, including bozo, missy and worrywart. Also, he swore a lot and she said that he sounded really uneducated. However, whilst it would be really easy to take that at face value and be like, okay, maybe this person isn't very educated. You have to think about the planning that I've talked about so far in the crimes. It could well be that he's using the accent and those words to kind of throw off the scent. He's putting around an act because there is a hell of a lot of sophistication going into these crimes. Nicola was also, by the way, able to, I suppose, corroborate to some degree the details of the vehicle. So first of all, as previous victims had said, thought it was old. First of all, he struggled to actually start it. He then had told her that it was a friend's car that it's stolen. I imagine that we can easily believe that's a lie. And she was also able to say that she heard planes flying low when she was being held captive. So the authorities were then able to establish that it's really likely there'd have been a flight path on which the house would locate it. It's incredible that she was able to create that detail during such a traumatic episode, but also when she didn't even have her vision available to her. I have this absolute belief that Mr. Cruel was very familiar with police procedure. I hate the fact I've got to call him Mr. Cruel, genuinely. I just want to call him something really inappropriate that I can't do. And it irks me that this is his moniker. But anyway, he's definitely aware forensically of police procedure, he really is. Aside from the obvious planning and meticulous detail that he has there, forensically he's avoiding getting caught because he's washing the girls and making sure they wash themselves. And Nicola says that he's even aware of the detail that plays out after she would be freed. He tells her that First of all, she's going to get spoken to by the police. They're going to ask her loads and loads of questions. It'll all be about trying to identify who he is. And then she's going to get taken to hospital. There'll be a police surgeon who will examine her because they're going to be looking for evidence to link him to her. And he says they're not going to find any because clearly, as far as he's concerned, he's made absolutely sure that there won't be any forensic evidence. And then he also tells her when she would be returned home. So... Clearly, he's got this schedule that he's sticking to. He's literally saying, this is all going to happen and this is at the point where you're going to be returned home. So he's clearly meticulous, almost OCD to some degree in the way that he's expressing this understanding, this playing out of how the crime will be dealt with after he releases her and also when he's intending to do that. Also, what are we seeing in this crime? Again, he's getting more bodacious with his criminal activity. So he keeps this poor young girl for a very long time, essentially. He keeps her for a long period. He also abducts her at night rather than in the early hours of the morning. So there's far more chance at the time that she was abducted that somebody may have seen it happening. And so he's risking getting caught. So he's getting titillated by that. But the confidence is there, the arrogance is there. At this point, the police launch Operation Challenge, and this is all around investigating the abductions and the sexual assaults. And even though they have this Operation Challenge launched, literally no suspects were identified. None, none. I feel like there's a lot of information the victims have handed over. I know we don't have Forensic detail, I appreciate that. But they have been quite specific in his height, in his age, in his hair colour, in his pot belly. I do feel like surely there should be some kind of people being thrown into the mix as potential suspects, but didn't happen. We get to nine months later. This is the 13th of April, 1991 in Templestowe. It's around 8.40 p.m. 
Now, this is the first day of the autumn holidays, the autumn school holidays. This is when they believe that Mr. Cruel struck again. But there's a massive difference in the particular crime I'm going to describe now, because the outcome is very, very different. So a man wearing a balaclava and also armed with a knife breaks into the Chan family home. Parents, John and Phyllis, they're out. They're working in a Chinese restaurant that they ran. That particular Chinese restaurant was just 10 minutes away from the home. At this point, they'd left their 13 year old daughter, Carmine Chan, to look after her two younger siblings, nine year old Carly and seven year old Karen. The intruder breaks in threatens them with a knife and takes Carmine's younger siblings and locks them in a cupboard, then barricades it with a bed. And then he takes Carmine. He walks her to a nearby vacant block where his car was waiting. Now, following Carmine's abduction, her parents go and make this really emotional television plea for her safe return. Of course they do. It's blindsiding, breathtaking, just so breakingly painful to imagine sitting and having to give a press conference about the child of yours that's missing, that's been taken. The police believe that at this point, Mr. Krull's responsible. So because of that, initially they're pretty confident that it's gonna follow the same pattern as before because they know what happens, yes, a child is abducted. Yes, harrowing, horrible, terrible things happen to that child, but at the end of the day, they're set free, they're found, they're brought home, and life will find a way of healing those horrible wounds that he inflicts. But that doesn't happen. The child isn't released at a nearby location like before. And those hours, and days and weeks turn into months and there's still no sign of coming. That changed 12 months later when a dog walker discovered Carmine's badly decomposed body on the 9th of April 1992. She'd been buried in a shallow grave near a landfill site at Thomastown, Melbourne. It was just behind a electricity substation, just discarded in that shallow grave. When they were able, finally, because obviously there'd been a great deal of decomposition, it was 12 months on, they were actually able to establish that she had been killed by three gunshot wounds to the head. Her parents actually later created a memorial at the spot where her body was found. I suppose that's a way for them to claim that site for legacy as opposed to horror. But obviously that's very, very different. We're talking about a child who's been taken and now a child has been murdered and dumped. And that's certainly a shift in what we've seen in the prior crimes. Now again, at this point, police have got no leads. They've got hardly any information to go on at all. But what they did have was the fact that the abductor had spray painted on the Chan's family car. They'd spray painted this, payback, Asian drug dealer, more and on, more to come. Now the police again, they just think that that was a, another red herring. First of all, neither of the parents were in any way involved with drugs. There was no illicit dealings in their life whatsoever. But again, it means that this person is trying to deflect in different directions. They're trying to take some kind of control in how the investigation will play out. But also there is a part of me that thinks that they just enjoy what they believe is a pantomime to some degree, that they're in charge of casting the characters, of laying the scene, all of this for them. There is a a level of fantasy and theatrics within it. As we've seen in the previous cases I've talked about today, no useful forensic evidence was recovered from the crime scene. There were no fingerprints, no DNA. Although they were able to find out that there had been a man in a sedan that had been watching Cummings' private school bus stop opposite her house on successive 
mornings. Again, I'm gonna just say it guys, like they are really important things to notice. If you see some weirdo sat in a car just staring at somebody's house repeatedly for a few days who has no business being there, just call the police. Risk offending, you might just save a life, genuinely. So also, aside from this, days before Kamein's abduction, her parents had literally deactivated the house alarm because something had kept setting it off. So the very fact that that alarm kept getting tripped suggests that maybe he was stalking the property, simple as that. Now, the investigators who were looking at this murder and the previous cases, they started to think that it's possible that the same man had actually been responsible for earlier attacks on adult women in Melbourne because there had been some that felt strikingly similar, just a different chronology, a different age group. So there was this incident where a man had broken into the home of an elderly nun, raped her and held her captive. He then drove her to a bank and he forced her to get her money out of the ATM machine because he wanted to steal her savings. The authorities suspected that Mr. Krull had likely been carrying out attacks like this and he had become desensitized to the sadistic attacks on the adult victims. So he decided then to target kids instead to satisfy his twisted desires. And that I guess could be the case. It could be that he's changed the chronology and interest base of the target, but I don't think you get more vulnerable than a 90 year old nun, to be fair. I mean, she really is in a scenario where she's totally defenseless. Also, this is just personally, I feel that when you have a particular predilection for children, they are going to be your targets, end of. I don't necessarily think you graduate from raping an elderly woman to then going for the actual typology of victim that really interests you. I could well be wrong. I'm just saying it makes more sense to me that they could be wrong in linking that crime. The police go ahead then and set up a task force spectrum. This is basically to look at all these different crimes that have played out. So over the next couple of years, they literally examined 30,000 houses and 27,000 persons of interest. That's a lot. So they have posters everywhere detailing the abductions. They actually get distributed to 1.4 million homes. That's a huge amount of work to try to bring some information in, just some, but literally no suspect would ever be identified. Not one. Now, the FBI, they get involved. Of course they do, because these agencies try to help each other when they are drawing a blank. So they provide a profile, and they believe that the suspect most likely lived in an area where the crimes were committed, because, let's be honest, seems really comfortable and familiar with the environment. Remember, this person walked his abductees through streets, etc. He knew where his car was parked and so on and so forth. So that certainly indicates somebody who's local to the area and they concluded that he'd probably be a considered a polite, friendly person, possibly with an eye for detail. They felt he'd be an introvert and that he'd be somebody who would be active in the local community because that would give access to kids. So they felt that maybe he'd be involved in a church. I don't know, maybe in the equivalent of cubs and brownies over there, throwing it out there, thinking about the knots. But they also felt he might be somebody who helped with children's sporting activities and clubs. They also believed that this was somebody who maybe worked in education because the offences had taken place either during or shortly before the school holidays. And they said that one of the things that he seemed to have was some flexibility. So he was able to actually arrange the offending behaviour around his work life. So, for example, when he abducted Nicola, he slept until 10 a.m. the Wednesday morning after he took her. So there is certain flexibility there, obviously. They believed that he was somebody who would have had a catalogue of sexual abuse material regarding children, probably had a history of sex offences, 
possibly starting with non-contact crimes like voyeurism, stalking, and then graduating to more serious offences. I'm just going to throw it out there. That particular profile, I do not feel is one of the FBI's best profiles. Genuinely, like, here's my profile. Thank you. Who are you? I'm in the FBI. Oh, that should be good then. Yeah, it's good. Take a look at it. So you're saying that it could be somebody who works in education because they either attack these individuals before the school holidays or during the school holidays. Yeah. But if it's before the school holidays, that could discount that they're a teacher. Yeah, but it's near them. I'm not that convinced that would... But okay, okay, thanks. Also, just throwing it out there, there's a lot of vagueness in this. Like, really vague. There's nothing very specific in the profile. It's just a profile saying that it's somebody that might work in the local area, might know the local area, might work in education, might not work in education, may be flexible in their job, may maybe not have a job. All of those things make it a very good profile. You know, you said you worked in the FBI. Yeah. What do you do? I'm a male guy. I'm the male guy. Okay. I'm just going to... Just gonna walk slowly away without breaking eye contact with you. Just saying, FBI can do some really good profiles. I don't think that was one of their best. So when we think about this heinous excuse for a human being and the crimes that he committed, Mr. Cruel is somebody who is a perverted child sex offender and killer. But Without a doubt, we are not talking about somebody who is like a disorganized, mentally ill killer. Bear in mind, we always know my caveat, mental illness does not make you a killer, but certainly, statistically, if you are a heinous criminal, sometimes you'll also be mentally ill. But we can say that that's not the case with this guy because there's order to his crimes. It suggests a sound mind. He's highly intelligent as an individual. He meticulously plans his crimes. So this is an individual that genuinely knows what he's trying to achieve. A lot of people do believe that Mr. Cruel is responsible for Carmaine's death. And there are lots of different theories as to why he graduated from being a sexual predator to a murderer. The most common is that people believe that unlike within the earlier crimes where he'd been very, very confident, he'd made sure that he was never seen by a victim, hence, he'd have the confidence to keep them for a long time and then release them at his leisure, that something had occurred where Carmaine was concerned where that wasn't going to be possible. Either she'd been able to identify him, she'd realised who he was, he'd shown his face, or she'd seen his face, or there had been something that she had seen within his home, which meant that she could have identified him and the consequence was he then shot her to protect his identity. It is worth noting he had told a previous victim that his liberty was far more important than their life. So that could well have played out. Some people also believe that it was the murder of Carmaine that stopped him carrying out subsequent crimes because no further crimes have ever been attributed to this guy. I suppose... Some people may wish to believe that even though he was a child molester, he wasn't a natural born killer. He wasn't a murderer. He didn't have the mindset for it. So that when he actually went ahead and killed this poor child, that something sparked his conscience and it satiated his desire to actually harm again. I feel that is far too convenient to say. I genuinely do. It might make us sleep better at night to think this kind of individual just suddenly gains the reality of what they've done, conceives of the pain that they've caused and traumatizes themselves for the rest of their life that they can never act in this way again. I think that that's a fairy tale. For me, I think there'd be much clearer and more obvious reasons as to why he did not offend again such as he may have moved 
because now he's a murderer and he wants to get as far away as possible. That could just be one of them. I'll cover some more in a moment, but certainly I am not at peace thinking that this guy just suddenly gave up offending. One of the things that I will say about him is he was a highly organized offender. Just think about it before, during, after the attacks, everything was about keeping himself safe. And the fact that he has not been apprehended, that is absolutely testament to this scrupulous planning to this organization. Without a doubt, he was good at it for his time. There's evidence that he stalked his victims, that he stalked the families beforehand, he knew their movements, he knew personal details like their names. He actually went to the crime scene with weapons. He was able to control the situation, despite that at two of the times, there were two adults present. So he wasn't feeling that he was gonna get into a situation where he was gonna overpowered. He felt completely confident. Now, I keep going back to this forensic awareness because to me that is disturbing. He was very forensically aware. I mean, he left no fingerprints, no DNA. I mean, this, was actually at a time as well where DNA was in its infancy. But it's as if he knew that, yeah, okay, they can't get a lot of DNA stuff now, but give it 10, 15 years, well, that's something that could bring me to justice. He knew that by leaving any trace of DNA at the scenes that they may not get him today, but, you know, today soon becomes the future, doesn't it? The investigators who have looked at his crimes, they suspect that he may well have worked in the area of forensics or be somebody who was really knowledgeable about it. But again, this isn't my sarcasm. I'm just gonna throw it out there. You don't have to be working in law enforcement to know that if you leave any trace elements of who you are at the scene of a crime, or on a victim, there is a bigger likelihood of you being brought to justice. Equally, if you are somebody who makes that person clean themselves thoroughly, you just know that you are reducing and minimizing the opportunity for you to be caught. You don't have to be brilliantly academic or sophisticated to be able to do that. The police as well. What can I say about the police? Honestly. The Australian police, to all of you who are listening, and I know, believe me, I know, American police, British police, I know they all have their issues. Of course they do, and their failures. And actually in the Western world, we're pretty damn good at caring and bringing people to justice. Although the Australian police, wow, at some points in time that I have researched, it's like the mob was running you. And I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. But they didn't, in this case in particular, do a very good job of doing what I believe is the most obvious thing to do when we're talking about child murder and child molestation. You know, just keep the evidence. How about that? How about, for a starter, we just make sure that we keep the evidence? Because, you know, it's evidence without evidence there is not going to be anybody brought to justice, right? So it transpires. Statements compiled at the time, you know, the ones from people who witnessed stuff, pretty important for any subsequent cases. Also, physical evidence, including cord and rope used to tie some of the victims, have been just lost. Just lost. Or just thrown out. Just lost or thrown out. What could possibly go wrong when there is a horrific child molester and potential murderer roaming our streets? What could possibly go wrong if the evidence linking them to a shred of rope, for example, just gets lost? You know, it would only cost lives. So the reason I'm saying that is because DNA technology right now is incredible. It's absolutely incredible insanely proficient and the opportunity to get DNA and to get a profile of his DNA which is possible because if you're tying knots there's a strong likelihood you've not got your gloves on genuinely if there was a shred of hope that we would get his DNA 
it's been lost because of that. The police investigations around this case concluded that Mr. Cruel could be responsible for as many as 12 unsolved sex attacks, all on women and children in Melbourne, starting in the mid 1980s. Now between 2010 and 2013, Task Force Apollo, they actually went back and re-examined these crimes and they were able to identify a similar pattern of offending behavior. Now, the signature seemingly had changed but nonetheless, when they looked at the pattern of offending, it was similar. Yes, the victim profile had shifted from adult females to prepubescent girls, so on a signature level, that's relatively unusual. They tend to have a particular type of individual that they go for, think of Jack the Ripper, Caucasian sex workers, think of Gary Ridgway, vagrants and sex workers, they're the kind of people that they went for psychologically to serve their needs. That was the type of person that they killed. We have got a shift here. And the shift is going from adult females to prepubescent girls. And remember, one of those females was in her 90s and a nun if they are linking that crime, particularly with the crimes I've talked about today. Now, this year, there was a potential breakthrough in the case. It's believed that Mr. Cruel may be linked to Melbourne's electrical industry. So they use this latest technology and by using this technical advancement, they created a map. So it linked similarities between the abductions of the three victims. So first of all, they were all abducted or released near electrical substations. Furthermore, all three of the victims lived nearby substations and Carmaine's body was found near a substation. Bear in mind as well that Carmaine and Nicola had also attended the same school, which was close to a substation. So the authorities basically believed that Mr. Cruel might have worked or posed as a substation employee or lived close to one. And again, I don't want to be too sarcastic because I appreciate this is trying their best and it's really important we reinvestigate cases to create closure and bring justice to the families but it could just be another red herring couldn't it I mean everybody knows if there is an area with quite a lot of substations so it could just be by chance these kids were released near them it doesn't actually mean that the individual worked at one and if he's a real planner and he's an intricate, organised offender, he could well have done that just to create another ruse, like the accent that he potentially put on and so on and so forth. Interestingly, Carmaine's 1991 murder was literally the last crime that was attributed to Mr. Cruel. How, therefore, can we even conceptualise that he would suddenly stop offending, stop abducting children at this point? And I guess we have to answer it in literal ways. So, could be dead, could be in prison. Maybe if he's still at large, he's just moved to a new hunting ground. Maybe he was interviewed by the police during the original investigation and he realized that he was getting very close to the edge of being discovered and so he stopped. Maybe he altered his victim type again. All these are possibles because his absolute behavior throughout this is that he was deceiving the authorities. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to throw them off the scent constantly. That is prevalent in the crimes, the way that he changes slightly, the things he says to his victims. He's just trying to make people believe that they are not connected. Remember the fake phone call during the first attack, possibly the change of his accent, the spray paint on the Chan family car and so on and so forth. It's logical to assume that he has continued to behave this way. And the fact that he hasn't been apprehended, well, that supports this contention. And what's really disturbing, and one of the reasons that I struggle talking about unsolved crimes is because at present, Mr. Cruel remains at large. He has never faced justice for the horrific, absolutely despicable, traumatizing crimes that he's committed. For the murder, potentially, of that poor girl. And let's be honest, that's another 30 years that has passed since the last crime he was potentially linked to. 
Imagine the amount of victims that you could have harmed during that period of time. Currently, there is a 200,000 Australian dollar reward. It's about 110,000 pounds in the UK because they want information about Sharon and Nicola's abductions. And there's also a $1 million, which in the UK is about 550,000 pounds reward for information about the death of poor Carmen Chan. The authorities, they've apparently, apparently narrowed their investigation down to seven suspects. And these include convicted sex offenders and also a former university lecturer former university lecturer. Interesting. Also, the police, just like I, have an issue with the moniker that Mr. Creel was given. And the reason they have a problem with it is because they feel by the media giving him a moniker, Mr. Creel, means that the public imagines that there is this particular kind of individual lurking in the shadows like some kind of terrifying looking predator that you'd be able to spot. They're not looking for the nice guy, the professional, the person who lives next door to them, not looking for that person because they've got this idea that Mr. Cruel is gonna look cruel. But that's not what it's expected to play out. This individual shouldn't be considered to appear unpleasant and nasty. In fact, quite the contrary. It's very likely he'd be polite, friendly. He'd be the kind of person that you would have as a neighbour and get on with. So if I was going to give him a more accurate, appropriate moniker, I would call him Mr. Careful because that's something that he has absolutely been since the get-go. This individual is careful. And whoever those seven suspects are that the police have their eyes on, I hope that one day they trip up one day they invite the police into the chink in their armour that they so carefully crafted so that the families of those poor victims get the justice they so badly deserve. I just hope one day he's apprehended. More than anything, I hope one day whoever's lost the flipping ropes, etc., and all the victim statements suddenly finds it again because, like I said, DNA technology has moved on. And that may well hold the key. It may well indeed tie him to the crimes. And that's so important before he claims yet another victim and destroys even more lives. Thank you for watching this. You know me, guys. I like my closure and I ain't got it today. But I'm patient. And you're patient. And who knows? Maybe... Mr. Massive Child Molesting Pedophilic Monster Stroke Mr. Careful will watch this and realise that people like us still care, still talk about these cases, still give legacy to the life he may have stolen and to the lives he's certainly ruined in many ways. And that one day, what we will get is that moment of joy as his non bellaclavered face and his no doubt even bigger bellied image is cast across our media as he's taken to court and found guilty of all these heinous crimes. Thanks for joining me. I guess what we can also hope is maybe he dropped dead, but maybe then we wouldn't get the justice and closure that we all feel the families deserve. Give me your thoughts. If you like my content, get your subscriptions on. I release it on a Sunday and a Wednesday religiously every single week. Please let me know your own feelings. Do you suspect anybody? Do you think it was a teacher, a scout leader, somebody working in the local community? Was it an individual working as an electrician and so on and so forth? Or was it just another odd stalking individual who hides in the shadows whilst acting as a chameleon in their day-to-day -day life? What are your thoughts? And do you think he's disappeared? Or do you simply think he's moved on? See you again next time, guys. Be safe.